Welcome everyone to the fourth episode, I believe, of the Young Aussie Entrepreneurs Podcast. I'm here with Matthew. Um, he's achieved quite a lot in his in his life. So, Matt, did you want to just talk a little bit about yourself and what you do and um, you know your experience in entrepreneurship? Yeah, I mean, um, I sort of got into entrepreneurship all accidentally. So, but um, what I do is is call is run a company called Nightlife First Aid. Mm-hmm. Very simply, it's just a first aid service, but I guess more dedicated at creating safe partying environments. Mm-hmm. So amongst youth, alcohol consumption, drugs, we just sort of send out first aiders to be yeah. on site at the parties if they're to help. So okay. very simple. Yeah, definitely. How did you, I mean, that's sort of like a, a really, really cool industry to actually be in. How did you, what, mm-hmm. what led you to get into that? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's definitely something unique. We've actually, I just got invited, um, well, I've been invited to a place, but just got invited to one in um, Amsterdam to sort of speak about the idea because yeah. it's like, it is a world first because we've actually done the market research and there's nothing of the kind internationally. The closest we actually found was a shoebox sized first aid room in um, mm-hmm. one club in Las Vegas. And all it had was just a bunch of equipment and that's all. So it, it's pretty shocking to, to know that something like that doesn't exist and yeah. that help isn't so readily available. But um, I mean, what sort of drove that is just, I was 17 at the time when I started, but at about 16 years old, you know, going out to parties here and there, mm-hmm. I'd always end up helping people who got in bad situations because of alcohol, because I had five years of training in St. John Ambulance. Okay. And, um, and I guess, there are a few times in particular where it got really, really serious and I'd have to, you know, travel to hospital with, with their family members. I'd be sitting in the hospital cause I can't drive. So just trying to wait, wait for a ride home. Yeah. And it, it just sort of gives you time to think. And, um, I guess I think in one point in time, it was, it was an annual event. Yeah. So the following year I offered the service voluntarily, but it was, it was a crazy night. It was absolutely insane. I was working nonstop treating weird injuries like i didn't even expect hypothermia at a party mm-hmm. uh you know you'd expect the opposite people jump, yeah. jumping around like getting hot and sweaty you, you wouldn't expect hypothermia so um at the end of the night that they, they wouldn't let me leave without paying okay well wow. about eight other people come to me wanting me to do their parties and that's when the sort of switch flicked and i was like this i mean the demands here i yeah. can supply it this, this is this is an idea yeah, definitely. Um, and the business obviously wasn't anything at that stage. It was just you, you know, helping people and you just got that idea. It was actually that event. I, it was technically my first official event was my own formal after party. So it was okay. literally just me yeah. and my friends. Well, did you ever, did you ever plan? Because I mean, I'm not sure if there's any real characteristics of like what an entrepreneur is supposed to be but did you ever have any plans of mm-hmm. becoming an entrepreneur or getting into business or this just kind of sparked you and said I, I need to do this i need to help people yeah no this this just sparked it i mean never really had any entrepreneurial experience or even any business knowledge or anything yeah. so everything i've sort of done has been well accidental at the start but then you know self-taught and um, yeah it's, it's just sort of i always wanted to be a paramedic uh, for, for certain reasons. That's why I joined St. John in the first place and got onto this medical path. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then this sort of happened and then a lot of success came with it. I mean, I think within six months to a year, it was yeah. about, it was about six, between six months to a year, I was actually a top four finalist for Young Australian of the Year. Wow. And I was like, wow, crap. <laughs> and, then, and, then the, and then things like that sort of followed and it was just things that no one in my family had ever experienced. Yeah. And it just, it just, all of these things just sort of just completely open up your eyes to this whole other world. And it was just, um, so I kept going with it and yeah, still going now. Yeah. I mean, you talk about it as a whole other world and it really is, but, um, the, yes. the YA community is obviously quite young. How did you, I mean, but even just at 17 and 16, like you mentioned, how did you find it starting business? For you, was it set about setting up a business or just helping people? Like, how did you go at that age? Um, I mean, for me, it was a bit of both. Obviously, the business is all, is all designed around help. 
gigs and, and these parties. Yeah. But a big obstacle of mine was having to learn the business side of things as well because yeah. you can't really get that wrong. Definitely. It's never going to be perfect, but, but as long as you're on the right path and then it, it's, it's a start, you know? Yeah. Um, so it, it was um, a bit of a confusing journey. I think some of the obstacles, I mean, like I said, starting at 17 years old, it can be tough for young people because the people who are older, the people who have made it, you know, you, you talk like big CEOs, they're not going to listen to you. It's hard enough to get a meeting with you. They yeah. don't give you the time of day or even take what you're saying seriously. Mm-hmm. So the biggest thing for me when I realized that was I spent a lot of effort into building up credibility yeah. because by doing that, people then started to realize, shit, this kid, he might be young, but he's serious. He, mm-hmm. he has the integrity to, to say something and then do it. Yeah. And that means a lot to people. So for those people listening that are either just starting getting into business, what are some ways you use to actually build up credibility? Is it just actually establishing the business or personal things that you can do? Oh, it's been both fortunate enough to get those sort of awards and, and accolades that I, that I had then and have now. Yeah. But there's so many ways to get credibility. I mean, like you said, it's in business. If you just focus on, on what you're doing and, and, get some success and, and actually get some proof that, that you're sticking to, to your word and you're doing what you do, yeah. then it's great. If you say you want to have a multi-million dollar business within a couple of years, mm-hmm. make that happen. Sort of maybe write it down or so that they're able to keep you accountable. Yeah. And when you eventually do make it and you say it, people aren't going to say, oh, he's just making that crap up. Mm-hmm. Let people know or, or do something to keep yourself accountable. So that when it happens and you're able to share the story to try and help others, they don't think you're just making it up. But then also have that accountability so that people can see where you started and then where you are now. But again, don't just do it focusing on, on other people though. You've you got to focus on, on yourself and it's what you want for your business, for yourself and yeah. the goals of your business aligned with where you want to go in your personal life as well. Yeah, because I mean, even just with your business, you are genuinely interested in growing this business and pushing it worldwide, like you mentioned, just because of yeah. that, you can actually yeah. help people. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, and the opportunity is a big thing as well. Yeah. You have to make sure that you're being realistic. So for me, I'm thankful that the opportunity is there and I'm able to now have that goal to expand internationally. But um, just the fact that... that um like before I even, even did the market research, that, that was not necessarily the glit in stone. It was yeah. a thought, but that was what I wanted because that, that involves helping everybody. Everyone in well, some point in their life affected by drugs and alcohol. Yeah. When they were young, they were, they were the people doing it, going to parties and, and, and you know, maybe having a drink. And, and these days doing drugs is, has become a very common thing. Yeah. Um, so you know whether whether when they were kids they they did it when they're yeah. adults their kids are good when their grandparents their grandkids are going to be doing it so it, it's always sort of affecting them and so um yeah it, it's about that, that um sort of reaching as many people as we can it's mm-hmm. about the educational aspect of it but there's a lot to it that um that really allows us to help so many people which is for a social entrepreneur like myself. Yeah, is a, a massive um, win for me. So, just in terms, because because obviously your business, like you mentioned at the start, is it's really just the, you're you're the creator of this sort of business model, and it's weird how sometimes yeah something that people have done for you know a long time drinking alcohol, and then you've got the first aid people. It's weird how you can just stumble over these business ideas. Have you <laughs> stuck with the same model that um you you initially started off, or have you adapted the way you do things over time? no no the models actually all stayed the same i mean i've explored other ideas people have suggested things to me and and you know yeah i'm all about like i'm, I'm always going to take things with a grain of salt if someone says something to me mm-hmm. I'll, I'll explore it and if yeah. i'll do it if not then so be it and we'll keep moving on mm-hmm. but um yeah i mean it's it's all about just just going with it but yeah my my business model is also to say the same 
Yeah. Um, it, it just worked. And not only that, what I find really strong is that night has always been and still is self-sustainable, even into the future with our future plans. Mm-hmm. It's, it's still self-sustainable, which, which proves that um, I actually got a model. And I think, um, believe it or not, I actually think that comes with the lack of business understanding that I had when I started. Mm-hmm. Because before, I didn't know about funding. I didn't know about investors. I didn't know about any of that. Yeah. I thought a successful business was one that could support itself and grow through its own funding. Mm-hmm. Obviously, when I got into entrepreneurship, you know, I saw all these people celebrating, you know, their Series A funding and like raise capital and all that sort of stuff. And it, and I'd I don't know I'd still I'd place more like credibility and trust into someone who builds a business that can support itself and and be it, you know self sustainable in in its own operations. So in that respect, because I've seen a lot of posts in, in the YA community about funding, whether people should go mm-hmm. down that route, what are your opinions on actually getting funding? Is it worth it? Is it just sticking to growing it in that, your business organically? Or? Do you know what? I, I, I mean, funding is obviously very important. Mm. I think when you're starting out a business, it's important to, to realize if, well, to sort of see whether it can fund itself. Okay. You know, it, it's always great to, to create a self-sustainable business model where the money you're through the sort of operations of the business mm-hmm. can support you as well as all the other business costs go back into the business um, and upgrade what you're doing. Yeah. Uh, obviously, wages for employees and, and paying, um, you know, the, everything you outsource and all that sort of stuff. Mm-hmm. But, um, but then again when it comes to expanding and growing fast, that's when funding does more because, you know, a sustainable business is great, but if it does, if it's not happening fast and you, you need to expand, you know, if you leave something too long, the opportunity is going to be lost. Yeah. So sometimes you do have to move fast and that's where funding sort of helps. It's when you have those sort of time constraints and, um, and you keep something, but, you do need the funds, but in saying that you're not going to get much funding unless you can prove that your business is still able to generate profit, which comes with that, you know, you, you, which which comes with that, um, self sustainability. I mean, you're not going to get much investment from a, from a prop who does their due due diligence unless your business shows some sustainability. Yeah. I, I think that's a really important point. And, um, yeah, I mean, maybe having that sort of proof of concept, I guess, as you could refer to it, just this is actually going to work and yeah. people backing your project have to have some sort of level of faith in what you're doing. So um, in terms yeah, absolutely. of, you talked about scaling and I think scaling is very fun, but at the same time, it comes with a lot of challenges. Um, mm-hmm. Did you experience any challenges along the way? Um, honestly, I've still got a lot more scaling to do. There is okay. still a lot more that, that we want to sort of achieve. Um, yeah. Yeah, I mean, there's challenges with everything. I mean, that's the thing you're always, I mean, it's in life in general. I was actually speaking about this earlier today, but it, like things are always changing. Yeah. And it's all about having that ability to adapt and sort of learn how it's changing and how you can work around that change and, and you know, improve what, you, what you're doing in yourself to, um, so that it's not much of a problem. But um, yeah. Absolutely. That was one of the first lessons I actually learned when I got into entrepreneurship, I guess, when I actually learned what entrepreneurship is, the first real entrepreneur I met, someone I really looked up to, mm-hmm. that was the first thing they told me is things are always changing and you learn to adapt to it. So I guess I was lucky enough to really have that drilled into me from the, the first second I got started. I really want to break down one side of your business, which is actually getting clients. Now, I want to, in, in just a sec, I'll, I'll touch on all the awards and achievements you've, because you have a very long list. Um, <laughs> in oh, terms yeah. of actually getting clients, do you, are you now sort of looking to work with music festivals and how do you go about getting those contracts for small to medium events? Mm. So in the start, it's all about just messaging people, trying to, 
find kids from different schools and be like, look, who's, who's organizing your after party? Because after parties were, or formal after parties were the biggest um, like market for us. Yeah. And it was all about finding those kids from schools and, and making those connections, getting the names and then messaging the hosts personally. Okay. Now that we're the only ones doing this and we've built such a reputation, um, we, we had a lot of people just come to us. Um, we had party like organizing companies try and partner with us. Some went really well, some not so much. And, and that's just part of business. Um, this reputation that we've made, a lot of the business comes just straight to us. And, and that's really fantastic. Now, I guess there's another challenge where we're looking to expand options and are, we're now actually targeting um, nightclubs first okay. because that is, that is absolutely a world first. There you yeah. would not find a first aider inside a nightclub, which is crazy because a lot of crap happens inside nightclubs. Definitely. And security don't want to deal with that sort of stuff. Uh, and then, as you said, music festivals are definitely at a later stage. Definitely want to look at them, especially all the stuff that's happening now with them. It's just um, ridiculous. Mm -hmm. It's definitely something we want to focus on as well. Thankfully, there are other first aid services that do music festivals. Okay. Um, which is why we sort of want to first um, utilize what we've already done in the past to now go into nightclubs first. But I think with our specialized experience and knowledge doing these parties and eventually nightclubs, yeah. we'll definitely be highly regarded for the festivals in the future. Yeah. So it's about really how we're positioning ourselves already for yeah. what's to come. Yeah, I think the one you just tapped on the word there, positioning, and I think um, you know any mm. business can scale very quickly if they wanted to. But I assume for you, um, protecting the brand and just that positioning in the marketplace is something that you focus on heavily. Just your reputation within the industry. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And I mean, I just, we sort of um, created this this whole concept of first aid at parties, and so not only are we representing like not only am I representing nightlife and, and business itself, but mm -hmm. I'm sort of building this whole concept and, and it's going to be something that other people can then use and build themselves to sort of do their own thing. So it, it's a, a really um, unique space. It's like, I'm sort of really need to be careful where I'm going and how I'm doing things because it is going to shape potentially a whole future industry. Of course. And that, that's something very powerful that I'm sure you carry on your shoulders, you know. Um, you know, it's, it's a very, very good thing to be able to be doing. So are you doing all the work yourself yeah. or you can outsource some of it? Yeah, yeah. I mean, like, it, it's very privileged to be, to be in this position. Yeah. That same person I mentioned before who told me about change, they um, told me that, I, like, this is when I realized that they, they told me I'm sitting on a pot of gold. Yeah, I agree. Um, but yeah, no, everything I've, I've to date, I've actually done myself and a lot of the stuff nowadays, I still do myself. I mean, as long as I'm capable of doing things myself, I'm, I'm the type of person who's just going to do them. Mm -hmm. If I need something outsourced, I'll do it. If I, if I want to support someone else and, and they're able to do something I need mm -hmm. and it sort of makes sense, then I'll, I'll pass it on and do it. I know someone who's um, running a bit of like a free law clinic at the mm -hmm. moment. So... I'm like, I was about to write service agreements for these nightclub contracts. I'll just pass them to them. They're offering to do it for free. They want the experience. Yeah. They're young for supporting young people. So go ahead. I've let them sort of take that project on. So okay. there's things like that. But um, yeah, today and, and most of the major things, yeah, I, I do it myself. So yeah. And that all came with sort of the journey of teaching myself and just cons like constant learning. Mm-hmm. And I guess this, the concept that you've, um, I would say, developed and this new way that you're changing the industry has brought you a lot of attention and good attention, I must say. How have, because for everyone listening, Matthew's been, it's a very long list that would take me an hour just to go through. How have you, in terms of Forbes magazine and those sorts of, um, you know, outlets, how have you gone mm -hmm, mm -hmm. in terms of getting in touch with those people and then how, just your whole experience with that? I just want to know a bit more about it. Yes, I think Forbes has been by far the um, biggest for me. Yeah. Um, it is such an honor to be named in Forbes. But then through that, we went over to their Forbes 30 Under 30 like little event in um, mm -hmm. Hong Kong last year. 
and oh, it was it was incredible. You know, meeting getting inducted into their community, um, meeting my first billionaire who like let's put it three billionaires live mm-hmm. in like just a whole nother universe. It's easy. Um, it all sort of came about accidentally. I mean, I, I sort of, um, you get, I think you get the option to nominate yourself. Someone else nominates you, but even if someone else nominates you, you have to sort of finish the, the nomination form yourself mm-hmm. for a reason that I really, really love. They say what you're doing better than what you do. Yeah. Which, which is something I really love. Like, <laughs> I mean, no one can fill out a nomination form for what for your business better than what you can. Yeah. Um, so I did that, and then, but it was it was such a uh, like stressful process because I'm I'm a big doer and I hate waiting. Mm-hmm. But it was literally six months of just waiting. Wow. And like after about three months, we got a questionnaire to fill out. The three months of complete silence, and they came out with the results. Just one did the list. And it was just this massive, like, moment of relief. Relief. It was just absolutely awesome. That's it's so powerful. How have you? Because I mean, obviously, not everyone gets the opportunity to meet a billionaire. How has that shaped what you do now? Just meeting those people in, in that network. That was that was a bit of an interesting one. Um, I mean, obviously, it doesn't change much about the way I do things now. Mm-hmm. But it's changed the way I sort of am planning for the future. Because, okay. I mean, if I'm ever, I mean, I don't really have a, a monetary goal as to, to what I want to reach in the future, yeah. which might be a bit weird for some people. But um, if I ever am to reach the status of a billionaire, you know, I, I know how to prepare for that. And even if I don't, I'm, I'm already sort of preparing for that sort of in ways that he taught me, I'm sort of preparing for, for the way he lives because yeah. even if I don't make it the full way to a billionaire, I'm still going to, you know, say be a multimillionaire with that billionaire mindset. And to me, that, that's, that's a fantastic way to be living. So, um, you know, cause it's the way they live, it's, it's all about um, consistency. It's all about, you know, continual like learning. It's all about, trying like new things having having the confidence i think is a big thing to just try new ideas and and not get too sort of caught up if if they don't sort of go the exact way you want to attaching yourself to perfectionism there there are a lot of lessons to learn from them it's just um absolutely incredible because i'm sure you know a lot of people would assume that once you you get to that financial level you you might just want to stop and and throw it all in but i'm sure as you probably you know experienced with a lot of these people they just want to keep going and just <laughs> like, i can't think of one billionaire that doesn't want to just do more yeah it's, it's crazy it's yeah it, and just being around those people obviously um how has that helped have you leveraged you know all the attention that you've gotten and and how have you used that because you know you're known like you said just about everywhere which is a great thing how have you leveraged that Oh, I mean, you have to leverage it. It Mm -hmm. is, I mean, that's, it's just about personal branding. Everyone has a personal brand and personal brands have always been around. Like they've always been a thing. The only difference Mm -hmm. is the way we marketing our personal brand in today's society. Mm -hmm. Because obviously they didn't have social media to market them that many years ago. So, I mean, we've always had a personal brand and that's how I sort of leverage it. It's just all about personal brand. I mean, um, I had, after getting named in Forbes specifically, a lot of people were wanting me to use their services or use their products. They'd offer it for free just so they can say that a Forbes 30 under 30 used it and sort of promotes it or like um, endorses it. Um, so that was a bit of a weird thing. Um, but then I had someone tell me, get on board, use this to, to get on company boards. Mm-hmm. And that suddenly became a really interesting thing to me because I never really thought about being on a, on the board of a company. And so I was into that and I realized that it's a really awesome way to give back. Yeah. Like, I mean, it, it's like you're not running the company, but you're doing like strategic planning for this future of a company, but then you don't have to do the day to day work. Mm-hmm. So you're able to massively contribute to, to this growth of 
awesome companies depending on, on what boards you get on. And it, it's such a privilege. And so I've actually been on a couple boards uh, here and there, some temporary positions, um, sort of almost like a bit of youth consulting, but sort of, mm-hmm. I always like to focus on, on how they can have more of an advantage for youth. Um, some other boards I've, I've now been on permanently and they just, the work, some of the work doing is one's a mental health organization and the work is um, fantastic. And so being able to sort of look at the future of, of these different industries, um, mental health being a very interesting one, it's, um, it's really cool. And it sort of gives you a bit of experience and, and lets you sort of dip your feet in all these different areas and, and see where the future is sort of going with all of them, how you can contribute. And um, yeah, I think it's definitely, definitely beneficial in that sense. And like I mentioned at the beginning, credibility. That, that's probably been one of the biggest ways that I've leveraged um, these sort of accolades is just through credibility. So people will actually start listening to me mm-hmm. and taking me seriously despite my young age. Okay, so I saw you on, when you talk about being on different boards, I saw you were um, part of the company called Trident Esports. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah. So what is that? Why? I'm, I'm just interested. Why that industry? Because obviously it's growing. Um, and what do you bring mm. for that company? Yeah, so Trident Esports, I mean, well, esports is one of the biggest industries globally already, mm-hmm. but it's actually, it's, it's like probably the fastest growing industry yeah. in Australia in particular. It's very much in its infancy, still extremely grassroots and has a lot of potential in the past. I've done, um, I've always had esports, not just playing games, but the business side of it. And so um, I've always wanted to get, to get more involved with it. And I guess with pride and I'm not um, on their board. I'm actually helping um in terms of like a bit of partnerships and sales, just trying to find them some sponsorships, which is what a lot of sports teams sort of rely on their, their funding. Um, but it's, it's, it's an awesome way to sort of, again, it's about dipping my feet into the industry. And, and I mean, in esports specifically, you, there are some incredible players like getting into it and, um, just to have that entry point into esports is is um, amazing. So a big part of it for me is just about um, entering the industry, getting that experience within the industry, um, like like I've been focusing on, especially with board positions, is um, focusing on the future of the industry. And when it comes to future industries, I think esports is is definitely definitely up there. And if you're not in it already, definitely try and find a pathway to get in it because okay. the way it's going. I mean, just today actually, I, I think. Forty-four um, million dollar deal, wow. even and one of the investors in that deal was Will Smith. Wow. Okay. So it's crazy. Yeah, yeah, it's crazy. I mean, um, <laughs> Aston Kutcher, he he's pretty heavily invested in esports. I've met the uh, the um, CEO of the company Aston Kutcher. Okay. Um, yeah, it, it's incredible. Uh, Shaquille O'Neal. There's been uh, soccer teams, uh, obviously in Australia, AFL teams, mm-hmm. um, NRL teams, and uh, NBA teams. Like everyone is getting involved in it. Yeah. So, do you plan over you know the next five, ten, fifteen, twenty years to get to you know these astronomical levels in business with the one business, or will you get there with um, you know multiple companies behind you? How? What's your game plan? I mean, that's, that's a really good question. I'd. I mean. Nightlife has the potential to become absolutely massive and I'd love to see it do that. Um, and that's what I'm focusing on at the moment. For me, you know, one, like, I don't want to get too sort of complacent because, yeah. you know, if you get too comfortable, you start sort of slipping up or like getting lazy and that's not something that I want to do. I'm, I'm always going to want to do other things and, and um, keep the ball rolling. So... I mean, if nightlife is, is that one thing, that's great. But, but when it gets to a, to a really stable point where it's almost running without me, that's mm-hmm. when I'll sort of start looking at other opportunities that I can, um, you know, again, build up something maybe from scratch where I can put a lot of more time into things. Yeah. So the other things on the side of nightlife at the moment, are just they don't take heaps of time away from nightlife. Mm-hmm. So they're not that big of a distraction. Whereas when it's a bigger, I can focus on, on, I guess, bigger distractions almost and, um, yeah, do other things. I, I mean, I guess 
long term for me is I'd love um, I'd love to to build up a company. Um, well, build up another few companies like similar to to Nightlife and um, things like that, and then yeah. build up sort of like a uh, like partner com- or parent company or something that, that um, to own all of them. Yeah. And part of that though is, is something I really want to do. And that this is more just a up of mine from what I've experienced in entrepreneurship is I want to um, invest in, in sort of like social good adventures. So, you know, for other entrepreneurs starting out, trying to do something in the, in the social good space, which have some sort of impact on, on society, I guess. Okay. So on that, let's, let's just say 12, to 24 to 36 months from now, what sort of an impact do you want to have within nightlife on the greater community? Nightlife. In, okay. Well, I guess within, uh, you know, 12, 24, 36 months, um, I think by 36 months, we'd definitely be um, about already expanded internationally. Um, Cause I've already started building those connections. Mm-hmm. Um, we're about to do this nightclub roller in Adelaide. Yeah. I think after that, uh, we're going to start expanding to other cities because, I mean, even even with the way things are going in terms of night after or just rules and, you know, like with the music festivals recently, mm-hmm. the demand is still there and it's still very high. And then after that, hopefully within that 36 months, it's it's um, time to go international. And we've looked when we went to Hong Kong, um, some of the nightlife there, I've done the research um, in Europe and, and there's needs for it everywhere. In Australia, it was all about, it's all about the parties. In, um, in Asia, their yeah. nightclub culture is in, when you look at Europe, their raves um, are massive and, and they have, you know, 48 hour raves where they're in spas the whole time, which is extremely dangerous. There's no first aid. Cool. And then in America, their pubs, you know, things can go massively out of hand. The pubs and casinos there, um, they could definitely benefit from it as well. So there's demand for it everywhere, but it's all different sorts of demand. And that's sort of, that's why it's, it's created such a massive opportunity for yeah. what we're doing. So do you put a number on your goals or is it just something that you say, we want to go international in 36 months? Yeah, I've, I've never really put a number on it. And I there are some people who are materialistic and, or care more about money and things. Some who don't, I mean, that's just, people are different. That, mm-hmm. you know, something I worry about yeah. for me, not only have I always been sort of like a, a social impact sort of person, but mm-hmm. I saw the like benefits of doing social good from, from doing nightlife. I mean, mm-hmm. not only has it given me all these other opportunities like Forbes and everything, um, because in Forbes, I was actually listed in two lists. So I was actually in the youngest and part of the social entrepreneurs list, yeah. which um, was, was pretty incredible. But um, just focusing on this, it's sort of like a train reaction, focusing on this um, mm-hmm. social entrepreneurship was able to get me the, the credibility and those, those blades and achievements, which then was able to get me more work or some other form of, of generating profits. Mm-hmm. So, um, you know, doing social doesn't just mean you're going to end up poor and homeless one day because you're only focusing on other people. It still has its way of returning monetary, yeah. like in monetary values. So, um, yeah, me, I don't really put a number on my goals mm-hmm. and I, I really have more of a social impact sort of um, way of, of, of listing my goals. And so, yeah, because I've always realized that, you know, if you if you say you want to make a million dollars a year, I mean, you can break that down and say, you know, how much is that a month or a week and this and that. But you can't really break it down and set in stone steps of how you're actually going to do that and achieve it yeah. and with, with like almost 100% certainty. But if you set out social impact sort of goal, you can break that into smaller steps. You can figure out ways to do it more efficiently. You don't set such a time on yourself mm-hmm. um, and... This, this, I mean, almost setting a monetary goal is, is almost like a, it almost constricts you. Like you, you feel like you can't deviate or you're just going to lose your path. So yeah. it, it, it has its benefits to it. And I just, I've, I've seen those benefits. And so that's why I'm, I guess, for it. So just from a social impact and, and even just the forecasting, the business point of view, do you put a number on saying, um, I want to help a million people within the next 12 months? So I want to, 
be doing 500 events a year or, you know, 10 employees. How do you go around that sort of goal setting? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. And, and I definitely have a goal like, but say, seeing it from a more realistic point of view, yeah. I, I mean, sort of look like every place that we're going to be has a different amount of nightclubs and, and opportunities in that. So, I mean, just for me, I, I'm sort of basing it around sort of like Adelaide, but I know Adelaide being really small, even what that's sort of given me is sort of undermining what we could really do. Mm-hmm. Um, but say in Adelaide, we have the pen- potential to have, uh, you know, just a, a bit over 100 staters. Uh, the way we're doing it at the moment, each first stater generates about $60,000 of, uh, um, of revenue a year at just two nights a week, of two eight-hour nights a week. So um, that, that's really good numbers. Um, and even better when you start going into profit and all that, and, and, you know, our costs and stuff, and it's just, like, the numbers are great. So I've sort of used that sort of framework around Adelaide and what we're doing and sort of focusing on now and then taking that internationally. So looking at how many clubs all the other places have and, and sort of, um, I guess, this is more specific to life and what I'm doing, but sort of looking at each location individually. And then at the end, you can sort of add them all up and then give that, give that estimate of like the goal we want to achieve. Um, but that again, just aligns with my values of keeping it realistic. Because, I mean, one thing I've learned in business is that when you're thinking of these ideas, I mean, you probably hear it as well every single day. Have you heard someone say, oh, I've got this amazing idea or I want to create this app. I want to do this. I want to do that. Right. You've heard that. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. Yeah. And when you start going into detail with those people, the things they're saying, it's like that, that's really awesome. Like having those goals are amazing. Are they, are, are you really thinking properly? Because a lot of those things seem uncontrollable and quite fluky. So, and, and that's what's interesting. In your head, you can control the outcome of everything. Everything can go the exact way you want it to. In, in, in real life, that's not necessarily going to happen. Um, and, and, you know, you can be as optimistic. You can, you can be optimistic. That's a fantastic thing. Yeah. But you still need to have some sort of realism to, to be able to prepare in case things sort of look different. So just on that, are you, are you worried about competition and revolution within your industry or as long as people are being helped? Um, how, how do you just go with competition and stuff? Do you have many competitors that you're worried about or do you even care about all that stuff? I mean, there's definitely competitors at the moment. None yeah. of them in the party scene. They see it as too much of a risk. Mm-hmm. But then there's also sort of other sorts of companies that have created a bit of troubles for us and, and that always gets a little bit annoying but mm-hmm. again it's not something i want to focus on too much i my mentor at the time like back when i first started and we were having those he told me just you know like don't dwell on that keep an eye on it maybe take some tips from what they're doing if, if it's if it's necessary yeah. but otherwise don't don't let what they're doing control what you want to do um in terms of that though like if people like being the first in this massive, massive like benefit for us because even if other people enter, we, we've already got the, the, the name for ourselves, that reputation. Mm-hmm. Um, and there's so much opportunity. Like you've got to have an abundance mindset. If we're the first in the game, there is a lot of room for other people to enter and us to do a massive piece of that pie. So an abundance mindset is really important when, you, when you're thinking about competition. In terms of that, I always have a good mindset around if these people get asked why they're doing it or what, where the idea came from, it's always eventually going to lead back to nightlife because not only is nightlife this, this thing, it was created alongside the concept of first aid at parties. Mm-hmm. And so it's that concept that all of this, all these other competitors are going to end up bringing the attention back to. And that again comes back to myself and nightlife and, um, and do you know what? Our competitors enter the game and, and, and they do really well. Mm-hmm. They're, they're, they're helping. They're helping the cause of, of saving young lives and uh, preventing unnecessary deaths and, and all of that. And that's a, that's a massive win for me as well. Yeah, exactly. And when you're driven by that, I mean, it's just so, I, I love, I love how you're just driven by being able to help people. Um, it, it's really admirable. Yeah. In- yeah, exactly. And, yeah. I mean, 
it's like a weight off your shoulders. And um, I mean, like I said, but it, it doesn't mean you have to sacrifice monetary reward. Yeah, definitely. You, you, you talked about developing, um, you know, the abundance mindset and all those types of mindsets. How important mm-hmm. is mentorship um, in learning those traits and, and building upon that? Yeah, I mean, I'm definitely an advocate for mentorship. A, a lot of the stuff that I know, sort of taught myself, mm-hmm. because they're coming from that background with with little knowledge on on all this stuff. Mm-hmm. But the mentors that I've had are amazing. And if you can get a mentor, not just one, but a, a, like a different mentor in all different areas, whether that's like personal life, business, yeah. finance, law, that's it's so powerful. And then if you just chuck them all together and make them your, your advisory board for your business, you're set. Like it, it's, it's a really way to just completely avoid obstacles that otherwise you'd have to find your own way over because they know what's coming. They've been there. They've done it. Yeah, of course. And I mean, as much as mentors are important um, for everyone, I know that you've done a lot of events as well um, around the world. Is that correct? As in like first aid events or? Oh, and just in terms of um, speaking events that you've done, um, impacting other people. Yeah, yeah. Speaking, yeah. I mean, well, yeah, impacting other people. Speaking, to me, I started that because it was such an efficient way. I would give back on an enormous scale. So that's mm-hmm. why I started speaking. And yeah, I mean, I haven't done any internationally yet. I've, I've, had, I've had the offers and, and definitely uh, I'm getting those in order for the future. Uh, but yeah, nationally at the moment, I've done I've done quite a few talks. I've gone um, Sydney, Melbourne, um, even Byron Bay, and places like that. So um, it's been it's been pretty incredible. From someone who very rarely travelled, my first time travelling was uh, 2015 or 2016 actually. Okay. 2016 was my first time ever travelling, um, and I was like 19 or something or mm-hmm. 18. So bit of a late bloomer when it comes to traveling people always tell me to try and travel a little more but um yeah I, but but doing the speaking and achieving what i have in business has has given me the opportunity to obviously travel at all so um it's yeah it's been amazing seeing all those different places and um hong kong like i was even that the, oh, the way they do business there is just crazy they're absolute workaholics well wow, so Obviously, you've been impacted by a lot of people, um, mentors and so forth. Whenever someone walks mm-hmm. in a room, um, an event that you're speaking at, what do you want them to, like, what sort of impact do you want them to walk out of the room? What message do you want them to, to leave having that you've given to them? Oh, I think, I mean, I think there's a lot of things I want to walk out with. I want them to walk out with a different outlook on social entrepreneurship. I want them to, um, if they're if they're new to entrepreneurship at all, or maybe a different perspective on entrepreneurship and business. But the biggest thing I want them to walk out realizing is that youth are extremely capable, and and pe- people are blaming us for crappy situation our our world is in at the moment. Mm-hmm but it's not actually our fault. We, 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 it, the, this, these problems of the world don't happen instantly. They take years and years to develop and, and, and sort of turn into what they become. So the cause of that was the past God knows how many years. Yeah. Um, and what's happening is, is they're passing to us now, but they're doing it with very little trust. Mm-hmm. So a message I'm trying to sort of preach is that youth are capable. And if you're going to give us this massive responsibility to now lead the world, you need to trust us to actually be able to do it. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, that's a big thing because, again, it came down to when I started, there was very little trust in me. There was very little, like, amount of people willing to and if I can prevent other young people having to go through that, yeah. then that'd be awesome. Yeah, and you were on ABC talking about this the other night. What sort of do you think needs to change, um, not only in the perspective of everyone, but just in terms of um, benefits that people who jump into entrepreneurship receive? What, what do you think needs to be done? Yeah, I mean, in terms of government, there are some really um, interesting points, not only from me, but things that popped up when asking the community. 
Mm-hmm. And, um, and then I realized <laughs> that that's all government need to do. Yeah. They just need to ask the community what they want. And someone mentioned, um, someone in the group actually, um, Bowie, inc- like she, she messaged me and incredible. She, she said, like, you know, people don't want to vote for things. They don't want to vote for policies and these resent, like these, these things. They want people. Mm-hmm. I agree. And, um, and, and not just someone who's going to make this prom- promise and, and whether it's an aid elected or whether it's a promise they're actually going to do and then go lazy for the next couple of years. She, want, like she, she said, what we want is someone who's going to be elected because of who they are, then while they're in, make a promise, follow the promise and actually do it. Mm-hmm. Then keep going, make another promise and do that and, and make these promises based on what people are telling you because you're asking, because you're listening to them, you're getting them involved in your work and you're getting involved with them. Mm-hmm. And that's what's important. It's like that human interaction, I guess. Um, so that was a big thing. But what I look at is that, I mean, in terms of advocating for youth, is that governments have so many different, like, advisors. Mm-hmm. Like, they've got, like, in, in law, in financials, in sports, in just in, in like, feminism now. It's advisors in every little thing you can think of. But you don't see many youth advisors, do you? No, not at all. If, if you want to give the world to youth, then get someone in who can actually relate to them and help you relate to them. So there's definitely something they can work on. There's a lot that they can work on. But honestly, I think next election, mm-hmm. so in, you know, in the next couple of years, yeah. uh, obviously for SA in like three years and, and you know, it's all different times, like state levels and regional levels of uh, federal and everything. Um, but I think there's going to be a big change up in all the next elections. I think youth are definitely going to start taking over, whether they come on as independents mm-hmm. or develop new parties. Uh, I think there's going to be a big change up in, in terms of youth leadership. On that note, there is someone in YAE yeah. who's actually forming their own party. I think they made a few posts okay. uh, with future odds and I think it's, there's, there's some pretty interesting stuff there, some pretty interesting, interesting policies and, and people mm-hmm. that are getting involved and um, definitely some things I want to keep an eye on. But um, whether that's how the youth start taking over or whether they do it as independence, I'll, I'll keep an eye on that. But I think there'd be a big swing towards um, youthful league elections. Yeah, of course. And, and as much as the government, I mean, the, a lot needs to be changed overall. Do you think the youth... Need yeah. something, whether it just be you know the youth step out a lot more and make it a lot clearer that I'm young and I'm in business. Or what do you think the younger people need to do to do you know to change that perspective? I mean, I, I honestly I think a lot of young people are on the same page, yeah. and just with anybody. I mean, we're not all perfect, and, and and very. I mean, I don't think anyone's perfect, but um but we're all sort of on the same page about um, our beliefs and, and some people might interest in environment. Some might have or more of an interest in, in business. Mm-hmm. Everyone has, has different interests, you know, not everyone's the same. Um, and so it's about being those people and, um, and instead of opposing everything that it, other people are saying, actually sort of collaborating and, and using that collaboration to achieve sort of a, a goal that everyone's sort of happy with, which is, I mean, it sounds like a, a dream, but it's, it's actually possible. When you, when you look at details, I mean, it's actually possible. Yeah. I mean, I know governments, like at the moment, you've got Liberal and Labour, and, and obviously they're always against the. And what, what I don't understand is every single policy that Liberal comes out with or every single policy that Labour comes out with, the other one is against it. It's a good policy. I've noticed that, yeah. Just because just because obviously in the next election they want to win. But it's just maybe for, for a certain time, a couple of years or so, they were able to collaborate to, to form a, a complete government and obviously they'd get a lot more done and then set a time close to elections when they start, you know, putting out their, their material and stuff and, and trying to gain each voters. But I think 
for the couple of years while, while, you know, power is established with whatever party, mm-hmm. if they work together on certain things, a lot more would get done and, and we'd be living in a much better country. And I think, Not, I think yeah, and, just with so, that. I was just saying, in saying that, I mean, Australia is still an amazing country, but just yeah. like anything, it's, it's all about um, constant improvement and it can be better, but um, yeah. No, of course, and I think the youth do bring that aspect of, you know, wanting to collaborate more and, and bring about change, not by mm. attacking your opponent, but by actually working with them. 100%, 100%, absolutely. Now, in terms of um, overall, just because you've dropped a lot of gold just there, but in terms of overall business advice, um, you are very involved in your business and you want to see that grow and help as many people. What do you have for anyone who's mm-hmm. you know, a business or starting it just to how they can create their impact? What do you suggest? Oh, I mean, it's the same thing that many times and that everyone says, it's just do. Mm-hmm. I mean, like I said, starting out with enough, like no understanding or knowledge or anything. I didn't even know what an ABN was. <laughs> Simplest thing. Yeah. But like what it was like and i always describe it like this it's like you're in a pitch black room and there's one step in front of you and for me that was an abn mm-hmm. but it, for someone else it might be something else they've got to learn some sort of other obstacle they've got to overcome i heard about it, realized i needed it mm-hmm. got it and took that first step and then the next one lit up and that might have been something different and so time you learn something and, and implement it each step is lighting up and it's only when you get a certain way up to that staircase yeah. that you can sort of look back and see, see how far you've come, but you're never going to be able to even get one step up if you don't just do it. And a lot of things, a lot of things that sort of prevent people from doing is they want it to be perfect from the moment they, they sort of try and make it happen, but that's, that's never going to happen. It's, there's never going to be an, an exact time or say putting out an app, perfect design, perfect anything. You just got to sort of get it out there, get feedback and, and continually evolve it and, and change it. And, I mean, eventually make it, maybe make it perfect for that point in time, but it might be perfect for a couple of days and then something else is going to change and you need to again, yeah. evolve and adapt to that and, and change again. So it's all about just doing, just doing. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I couldn't agree more. And I mean, a lot of people in the group have talked about, you know, this isn't working for me, you know, I can't do this, but, you know, it might not happen now, it might not happen in six months, five years, but eventually you will have that breakthrough. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I agree with you. Now, you are very active in the community, um, the YAE community, obviously, and we're launching our um, YAE Mentors platform soon, and I believe you you are a mentor on, on that platform, so um, aside <laughs> from people being able to find you on that platform where else can people find you all over the internet uh oh they can sort of i think uh nightlife on the facebook page mm-hmm. uh nightlife website which is all you can you can find to the facebook page yeah. get find me in the way e group i'm all i'm always open i mean if i can fit it in like if i have time for it yeah. i'm always open for a chat on facebook i'm, I'm willing to have with people do a bit of mentoring myself for a very select group but um, i'm more than happy to to um bring some YAE members into that and, and see yeah. if we can work out some special offers for them. Um, I mean, if you Google my name, it's a bit of a, a difficult one to spell, but if you give it a crack um, and Google it, something will come up and then there's always ways to sort of get in or learn from what I've done. And mm-hmm. yeah. Yeah. And I mean, to those looking for mentorship from you, I, I would not hesitate at all. To anyone looking to reach out to <laughs> the mentor, I would not hesitate. So um yeah, I, I think what you have to offer to this world and what you're doing is exceptional. And you've, you, like you said, you've got a long way to go because you have massive, massive goals, but I think you're already crushing it already. So congratulations to you. I appreciate that, man. I mean, thank you. Thank you. I mean, like, like I was saying, I'm actually South Australian to be named in Forbes in the 30 to 30. Mm-hmm. and one of only very, very few Australians. So a big goal for my at the moment is to get more, not, I mean, South Australians is a big priority, but to get more Australians as a whole. To, to start making their mark in Forbes. I want Forbes to realise the potential that Australia have because mm-hmm. I'm actually trying to bring Forbes to Australia because the only places that don't actually have a Forbes. So oh. um, let's make it happen. Yeah, Why you can do it. Looking forward to it. And, and you are really going to change this world. So um, it's been great I having you. I appreciate it, man. 
No, no, my pleasure, my pleasure. So thank you so much. And um, yeah, I really appreciate all the gold nuggets you've, you've dropped. Thank you. Thank you.